All right, hello again. All right, so long day, doing another video. So this will kind of finish up uh, the lecture portion of urinary. You've got your lab portions. I'm not sure you spent some time learning the anatomy of the, of the kidney and the nephron, and the bladder and the ureters. But <clears throat> most people want to know, you know, why do I care about these systems? So we're going to talk about some medical considerations and just do this very briefly because we've done a little bit of this um, as we've lectured on other topics. So what are some considerations you've got to think about for the urinary system? Um, so some of the disorders uh, have to do uh, with the actual ability to urinate or urinating too much or not when you want to. Uh, so one of these is called nocturnal enuresis. Uh, so this is basically going to the bathroom at night, so bedwetting. And so these are those, uh, this is when the, you fail to respond to those signals that your body is sending you that you need to go to the bathroom. So if you think about micturition, uh, the bladder stretching and you're getting these nerve endings, these stretch fibers are sending a signal to you saying, hey, my bladder's getting full, I need, I need to go to the bathroom. Uh, for some people, they just don't wake up. I mean, those signals are not strong enough to actually wake them up. They're in such a deep state of sleep that they don't respond to that. Uh, this is really common in children because they're still learning. They're still potty training and learning this, their body signals. Uh, and they're such hard sleepers. If you've ever had a kid, you know they're just, they're lights out. They can just sleep through anything. Uh, so this is learned. And so there's, there's different treatments for this. Uh, sometimes it just takes patience. But that's, uh, it's not abnormal. It's not good or bad. It's, it's just life. Uh, so bedwetting is just that failure to respond to those signals. Uh, but again, that just takes some training and some work. And, and most people finally grow out of it. Uh, but it can come back, unfortunately, as you get older, because we know as, as patients become older and their brain function starts to go down with dementia, Alzheimer's, things like that, those people can also suffer from bedwetting because, again, they, they don't respond anymore to those signals that their body is sending them. So that's enuresis or nocturnal enuresis is um, bedwetting. So stress incontinence, uh, that is when especially in women, uh, and you've had a baby before, uh, all your pelvic floor has been kind of stretched out, and so uh, you call for sneeze or jump on a trampoline, and you have some leakage, so urinary leakage. Um, this can also happen uh, when people that are overweight, a lot of intra-abdominal pressure from all the fat can kind of push down on the pelvic floor and stretch those sphincter muscles and can also lead to incontinence. Uh, so one way to override incontinence um, is to do Kegels. Uh, there's things called biofeedback you can do, um, and there's also some uh, bladder slings and surgical methods to overcome stress incontinence. Again, it's a normal thing. It just happens as you get older, but there are some things you can do to improve your quality of life if you have this. Uh, and then a third thing is urinary retention, and this is the inability to go to the bathroom. And this is common in men who have enlarged prostates, either prostatitis or prostate cancer, just as men get older, their prostates get bigger, even if it's not cancer. If you think about the bladder, and then, of course, the urethra comes out of the bladder, and the prostate is just around that. And so if it's enlarged, it will basically kind of squeeze the urethra so that you can't void the bladder. So it's the inability to empty the bladder. You see this a lot of times with men, again, with enlarged prostates, and they can go in surgically um, and kind of open that up. And there are some drugs uh, that can treat that as well. So again, uh, these are obviously signs of old age when you start to have these two things. Uh, kidney stones, very common, uh, can happen in people of all ages. Uh, and it's when you form kidney stones, uh, it's a crystal, uh, basically a salt crystal, and it's usually going to be something of either calcium or magnesium or uric acid salts. Uh, and so sometimes this may be a just your own physiology, your own pH, you know, your, the way you're built, maybe uh, you're, what you're eating, too much of, a, too much of something, maybe you're, you have a high calcium diet. Uh, it's really hard to predict who's going to have kidney stones and why, but that's what happens. When you think about the kidney, when you think about the renal pelvis, which is so you have your nephrons, and so all you have those collecting tubules, and that's the horrible drawing, but urine collects in the renal pelvis before it leaves the ureter. Well, there are kind of some places with the, you know, think about gravity, uh, where urine uh, will precipitate out, and these little stones will kind of fall into these low places in the kidney, precipitate out, and crystallize and form these stones. Um, and so eventually, you know, something will happen, those stones will move, and if they're big enough, they can actually block the urethra. Um, 
I mean, sorry, the ureter, block your ureter, um, they may actually start to travel down the ureter. But again, these are crystals. So crystals are sharp and spiky. So as they start to move, uh, they start to <laughs> scrape through the, through the ureter and that can be very painful. Uh, so usually when people are passing a, a kidney stone, they're in a lot of pain. And then it'll kind of get to the bladder where it's kind of floating around. So all of a sudden the pain's gone. But then what happens? Then it's got to get to the urethra. So um, for women, that's not so bad because the urethra is short. So if you get it through the ureter, you're kind of golden. It doesn't take a whole lot to get it through the urethra. For men, that's a little more fit. they got to go through basically another, uh, another uh, time of pain sometimes. So these are stones uh, that can either be broken down, they can, they can send uh, sound waves in to break them up, or you can maybe take some medicine to try to lower your risk of getting uh, kidney stones. Uh, if you tend to have chronic bacterial infections, that can increase your risk. If you t don't go to the bathroom, you tend to retain urine, uh, so the urine doesn't flow down into the bladder like it's supposed to, and it kind of builds up in the urine in the renal pelvis. That can lead to kidney stones. Uh, people that have high calcium uh, levels in their blood, that can uh, lead to kidney stones. And um, urine pH uh, can cause those crystals to form. So sometimes if you're prone to kidney stones, they may look at your diet and see if there's anything they can do uh, in that way to reduce your chance of getting them. Um, I've never had one, but uh, I've seen people pass them and it, it looks very uncomfortable. Um, Another disorder uh, would be diabetes, and so diabetes comes from the word, uh, the Greek word that means siphon or run through. So it's basically a running through of an increased urine volume. So excessive urine volume is where the root word diabetes comes from. Uh, if you think back to the endocrine system, we talked about two types of uh, diabetes, diabetes insipidus and diabetes uh, mellitus. And so back in the day, before they had the strip test, the only way to really tell if what was causing the diabetes was to, to uh, do a taste test. And so they would taste the urine, and if it was sweet, that would be the diabetes mellitus, which means you were having a sugar problem, okay? That was an insulin problem. So go back to your endocrine system and review type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, if it was insipidus, that means it was not sweet, it lacked flavor, that was a problem with hormone ADH, okay, which has, um, so you're having uh, not a problem with sugar, but a problem with your ADH hormone. So I'm not going to go back and, and talk about these again, because I know we've kind of talked about it with the endocrine system, so that you're on your own to go back uh, and make sure you understand the difference between diabetes insipidus and diabetes mellitus, okay? Uh, one more thing about the kidney, uh, you can, again, if you have chronic diseases, diabetes, high blood pressure, that can affect the kidneys. And so one of the ways you can diagnose uh, that is to look at GFR. And one of the ways you can do that is to do a clearance test. It's called re renal clearance. And it's how much plasma the kidneys clear of a particular substance at a given time. So they can give you something and then they can see how quickly you're able to get rid of it. And by doing those tests, that tells you what your GFR is. Um, and that's a way to look and see if the glomerulus is damaged and also to see how your renal disease is progressing or not. Is your GFR maintaining stable? So is your, your disease is kind of stabilized? Or is GFR getting worse and your, your disease is progressing and getting worse? Um, I'm not gonna make you calculate a renal clearance, um, but if I did, <laughs> these are all the things that are involved in um, calculating renal clearance. So if you have any um, thoughts at all that you'd like to maybe work with dialysis patients, um, you might want to spend some time kind of going in and, and reading up about renal clearance and learning up about that. Um, but we're not going to focus on that right now. Um, but what that tells you, if you have a GFR that is staying below 60 milliliters per minute, that's, that's the clearance that you're, that you're um, measuring, if it stays that way for more than three months, that's a chronic renal disease. So that's an indicator of something like diabetes, mellitus, the sugar one, the, the insulin one, or hypertension. If it's even lower than that, uh, like below 15 milliliters per minute, that's renal failure, all right? And so this is gonna be someone that's gonna need a transplant. Uh, they're gonna need dialysis. Uh, they're, not, they're not gonna live very long. They've got to be taken care of. Um, a clearance of that long causes something called uremia, 
which causes ion and hormonal imbalances. It causes metabolic uh, abnormalities. Toxins start to build in, into your blood. It can even cause some mental problems. Um, so therefore, you have to go on dialysis you know, two, three times a week uh, until hopefully you can find a donor and get a kidney transplant. All right, so uh, renal failure is any GFR is below 15 milliliters uh, per minute. All right, so that is it. Yep, that's all I got to talk about today. So again, uh, this is the end of your physiology lectures, and then you'll spend some time with your renal lab material as well. Thank you.